Hello. Hi. Morning. Let me set myself up here. How you doing today? I'm good. Ooh, wonderful. All right. So let's get started with some breathing. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm going to mute you, Susan, just so that like people who are watching on the replay, mind muting yourself. All right. And you can obviously ask any questions. Those of you who are watching on the replay or watching live on Facebook, ask questions in the Facebook and I will respond to them later. Let me get myself set up here a little bit differently. I had to last minute change my location because my one of my rooms didn't have good internet service. All right, so this is better. This is better. And... Uh, let me see what we're doing here. We're going live on Instagram. Instagram cracker, like my kids like to call it. All right. All right. Hi, Melody. Okay. Am I on? All right, so we're gonna get started with some breathing. Ah, and I need these breaths today. It's a little bit of a crazy morning. My kids are with me and we're doing the whole distance learning. So that's always an adventure to say the least. Ah, and there are always some like last minute, little last minute snags, right? Getting them set up. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna regulate my nervous system right now. Oh, and feel my, I want you to feel your hips and seat. Oh, wherever you're sitting, whether it's on a bed, on a sofa, on the floor. Oh, maybe roll your shoulders a little bit, move your head. Mm, and give yourself some nice, Ha! Ah, make some breath or make some sound with your breath. Ha! Ah, ha! Ah. And the vibration of your voice helps downregulate your nervous system. And of course, our conditioning and socialization teach us not to make these kinds of noises, but Full permission to make sound right now. Ha! Ah, mm. Just let yourself shake out a little bit. Ha! Ah, whatever ah, stuff is here right now. Ha! Ah. So yesterday, I shared some of my story and why I'm passionate about supporting healers, leaders and purpose-driven entrepreneurs in following the path of pleasure as a way of healing your trauma, owning your power, and thereby creating a culture, right? In your immediate surroundings, but also in the, in the bigger, right? In everything you touch, the ripple effect of everything, of everything you touch, a culture of fierce compassion um, in your work, in your life, in your relationships, even your relationships, with your children and so much of trauma work is getting in right relationship with your power and you know just from the place of beliefs we don't we are not in right relationship with power um, we have a lot of baggage about power because our experience with power is that it's been misused. It's been used against us. It's been used to harm. We don't need to look very far to see where that's happened. We see it in our government. We see it maybe in an intimate partnership that we've had. Um, and maybe we've had our own experiences with misusing our power. I sure have. Um, but when I talk about power, I talk about your divine power, right? Your 
the power that exists within you that is that belongs to you that is about you holding your own energy your life force energy and i'll get more into that in a little bit but i just want to say divine power because it's yours you own it um and unfortunately because of some experiences we have in our life that power is taken from us it is taken from us from systems of oppression um it's taken from us with the traumatic experiences that we have whether it's you know shock trauma big t trauma or the subtle um little t traumas that we experience in our life and i'll get into those in a little bit so my work is with empathic sensitive spiritual purpose-driven women whether they're starting their businesses or not um, and what i see a lot with these women and maybe you can identify with this is that you have a ton of compassion for other people in fact like your heart is so wide open for other people but for yourself you're pretty hard on yourself and you yeah you're not as you don't give yourself as much grace um, as you do for other people um maybe you even gaslight your own experiences right you sort of deny your own sensitivity or you deny some of the you know some other subtle experiences that you have um people coming in okay yeah so maybe you you guess that your experience is like yeah you're not really feeling that or you ignore everything i'm gonna ask that you as you come in thank you so you don't give yourself permission to be human and what that means is that you don't give yourself permission to have feelings of anger or to feel your rage, right? And maybe it comes out in subtle ways in your relationship or um, in your partnerships or even with your children. You fear your real power. I see this in so many, in so many women who call themselves spiritual or who are on a spiritual path or on a spiritual awakening. They fear their real power because of the associations that we have with power and the ways that women have been allowed to have power. We're terrified of being seen, perhaps, right, of being witnessed. And maybe it's because we're afraid of being seen in our power or whether it's that we're afraid of being seen in the messiness of our lives, that we don't have everything together, right? And having it together is not a requirement. In fact, the invitation is to be yourself authentically human, right? Because this is what we want to see. Think about the people that you follow on Instagram or on Facebook. You want them to be real. Like you are, we are all looking for realness. We are all looking to see ourselves in other people, right? So you showing up in all of your energy is like what people are so thirsty for. Right? But we don't give ourselves really permission to have it. Instead, we hide behind this spiritual mask of serenity, of having it all together, of being perfect. And so in a nutshell, the work that I offer is emotional and energetic sovereignty, which results from healing those intimacy wounds, resolving those survival patterns, or at least, at the very least, becoming more aware of them so that you have choice, right? And so I wanna go into what is an intimacy wound. I'm gonna take a sip of my tea because I'm in a room right now that is not heated. So I'm a little bit cold and I'm like a little bit shaking. I need something warm. Mm. Okay, what is an intimacy wound? <sighs> These are the places that we got hurt the places in us that got shamed, the places in us that were not seen, not welcome, maybe even hated, or that were attempted to be destroyed in our early lives. And I'm talking here ages zero to six, right? Our most 
vulnerable places. Um, okay. Yeah, so these are our most vulnerable places. And these are the places that get triggered in our most intimate partnerships. This is, these are the places that come out. And um, so these are the places where, like whenever we get triggered, even when we get triggered by what's happening in politics, when Trump got elected, I felt, I was so triggered. I went underground for like three months. I was so depressed and it wasn't, it was so much deeper than having, you know, this idiot in the White House. Um, it was so much deeper than that. And it connected to my early intimacy wounds. And I did some deep healing work with that, but I had to recognize like, oh, this is what's happening, right? What is really getting triggered here? So it can get triggered in so many places. So things that we avoid, right? We avoid, like I said earlier, having our rage fully, right? We have it a little bit. It comes out maybe in a snide remark or in a little like lash out, but we avoid really going deep into the rage, really deep into the belly. We avoid really going into our grief, which is just another like the flip side of our love, right? It's connected to our love, our grief. We avoid going into some of our deepest emotions and our rawest humanity. And why do we wanna to go to those scary places as part of our healing? Because when you go through, you've retrieved a part of yourself that has gotten lost. You've connected to your courage because you felt the thing that you've been avoiding feeling and you regulate your nervous system, right? And I'll go back to the nervous system in a moment. But when you do that, you align with your purpose, which is, you know, whatever you devote yourself to in your life, whether that's your relationship, motherhood, your work or your business, you're more connected to your desires, which is a guidance, right? It's, a, it's like spiritual guidance. You're more accountable, i.e. you can hold a bigger space and more capacity with your clients or even with people who are, you know, not happy with something that you did, right? In your relationship or in your business. And you are more capable to wrangle the fears that come up around expansion coming more into your power, growing your business, all that stuff, becoming more visible. So I'm gonna back up into a survival pattern. What is a survival pattern? So when we get hurt, right? in these early intimacy woundings, whether it's through shock trauma or just the parts of us that maybe were ignored or unwanted, we develop ways to survive, to make it okay, right? And so we cut off those parts of our energy. We're like, oh, okay, that's not wanted here. Okay, I'll just put that away in a box. All right, I'll, I'll be a good girl or I will follow the rules so that I can get the love and belonging and safety that I need, right? And so this is all happening at the nervous system level, right? The survival pattern, yes, gets us the love and belonging, but it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of cutting off our energy. So I'll talk a little bit about the survival patterns. Um, and they create, trust me, they create most of our suffering within ourselves and in our relationships. And they're really important because they try to create safety, but they actually block intimacy. They block wholeness and they block our real pleasure. And of course, right, the place in us that is powerful, right? So I can't tell you how many times people have walked into my office and, you know, they're coming in with depression or anxiety. And these are like, you know, obviously like sensitive women, deeply caring women, women who care about what's happening in the world. And I asked them about their history and great, you know, childhood was good, it was fine, this and that. And as time goes on, we start to dig deeper. We start to dig deeper. And what comes out, what everything seems to come down to is these patterns. 
everything boils down to this. This is the pattern that I've seen in my work of 15, 20 years. Again, when we know these patterns, when we recognize them like, oh, this is happening again, we have choice, we have agency, we have sovereignty. And so we can either lead from our healing or we can, he we can lead from our wounding, right? In our business, in our families, in our relationship. That's the choice that you have now. So having that awareness is everything. And um, all right. And so one thing that I want to say about that too is that I think that where we are in our history, in our history, like in the like, history, is that we, oh. yes, I'm going to mute you, Susan. Um, and ask questions, feel free to ask questions in the chat and I'll get to it. Um, so something that we're needing more of, I believe, is vulnerability. We need to be able to drop into a more vulnerable place. But most of us don't learn that this is a safe place to be. I certainly didn't learn that vulnerability was safe. In fact, I learned that vulnerability was a liability. And so we're not practiced at this skill. And it's a skill that we really need in order for our humanity to survive and to be connected. So there's a bigger picture plan here. Um, what we see is the opposite. In fact, we see the use of power and money and consumption to fill these unmet intimacy wounds, places in ourselves. Um, and most of us have experienced leaders or people at work, coworkers, um, where the capacity for intimacy is shut down or we, where we feel guarded, um, where we don't feel safe, where we can't bring all of ourselves. We see it in our own resistance to softening into our vulnerability when we're in an argument with a partner, in moments of conflict or in moments where maybe a client is not happy with something that we're doing or they have a grievance. Um, we see it in the therapy and coaching industry where we've maybe fallen for marketing tactics, even like bro marketing tactics um, that are that prey upon scarcity and fear in order to make a sale. We see it in masking of our real selves and striving for perfection so that we can avoid the experience of being judged or criticized, unfollowed, called out. And um, I'm saying we, and I'm saying I, because I've, I've been that person and I've done all those things. So I know this disconnect and I know the place, like that incongruence between what we say and what we do, how that feels uncomfortable, that split within ourselves. And you can feel it in other people. Like we've, we have plenty of examples of leadership where the person is saying all the right things and we're like, we're feeling something. We're like, something doesn't feel right here, right? So we're like, we're energetic beings. We can feel this stuff. And that creates a lack of safety. When we feel it within ourselves, we don't trust ourselves. And when we feel it in other people, we don't trust those people, right? And our job as coaches, as leaders, as entrepreneurs that are holding space for other people is to create safety in the interactions that we have. And if we don't create safety, then at least we can hold ourselves accountable when somebody says, hey, I don't feel safe. So that intimacy and connection can only unfold in the presence of safety and trust. So let's create a culture of that within ourselves, within the circles we operate in, within our businesses, within the bigger picture, right? And that means allowing your imperfect humanity to show up, authenticity, intimate vulnerability. So, all right. So when we talk about power, we have to address the nervous system and it's not the sexiest thing to talk about. I recognize that, but um, we have to, we, we do have to talk about fight, flight, freeze and fawn. It is everything and how it plays a role in power dynamics. So I just wanna share a little, I wanna pause for a moment and see if you have any questions? And I want to tell a story as you think of what questions you have. But I was at a workshop 
a couple months ago, and our teacher said to us, a group of people who were, you know, embodiment people, and he said, I want you to rank yourselves in order. Like, who's the, who's the first leader in this group? I want you to rank yourselves in order and see who's like the most powerful to the least powerful. And we're all looking around like, oh, shit, how do we do that? And right, like we were, we were pretty dropped into our hearts by that point. And we were like, okay, and we're looking around like, oh, no, but we're all equal. And why can't we share our power and this and that and blah, 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 blah. And we're like, no, 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 we're not even doing this assignment. We're forming a circle. We're going to like, um, we're going to share our power. And what came out at the end was that everybody in the room was like, assuming that they were top dog because that's what the nervous system was saying. Like I was, I was like, no, 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 I can share my power, but my nervous system is like, I don't need to prove that I'm top dog. I am top dog, right? That's what my ego was saying. And it was so awesome to then see people showing, like expressing that ego self that says, no, I'm on top because it was so liberating to be like, yeah, that's what's actually happening in the background. That's what's actually like happening in the background. My nervous system is saying, I'm top dog. I've got this. Like you are all ranking lower than me. So it was a big haha for all of us to just recognize that, that even though we had the bigger intention of being, of sharing power, that there was something else happening in the background. So this is why the nervous system is so important. And we often are not aware of that stuff that's happening in the background. <sighs> So a huge part of your healing is regulating and co-regulating your nervous system so that you can come back to a safe and social state where intimacy can happen. Yeah, fawn. Fawn is a big one for sensitive and compassionate women. It's like, is where we do power under, where we don't take up the space that's ours. Um, and that's often it's connected to like wanting to be liked, connected to our fear of being criticized or judged. Um, all right, so I'll finally get into the energetic patterns. Sorry, it's taken so long. I really wanted to um, really present it in a way where you can digest it. So these patterns form, like I said before, with our early caregivers and the environs, environments we grow up and they include our socialization into systems of oppression. And that I'll get to tomorrow. Today, I'm just doing like family systems type stuff. And because many of us don't receive adequate nourishment and mirroring as children, these survival patterns and like it's energetic patterns, but we then like we form a way of surviving and that we that becomes our normal place to be right? Until we become aware of them and we do the work to transform them. And the habitual piece is why it feels normal, right? So the patterns have to do with how, how energy is moving in the body. So these limit intimacy, and we have so much more capacity for intimacy and connection than we even know, because our bodies adjust to the limits of this capacity, and um, it's like looking through a mirror, through a broken mirror and believing that what you see is real, like the distortion is real. And so a lot of us live in that distortion and we just adjust to the distortion, but we're capable of much more. So the first survival pattern is moving away from others, right? It's just like, you see this a lot in like really spiritual people who are, who are like above it all, who are like, Sometimes it comes across as spiritual bypassing, like, oh yeah, like I don't do all that human stuff. Like um, I'm above that. I'm, I live in the spiritual realm and um, we're sort of like pulled up and out of our bodies. And this is my, <laughs> we leave our energy. We leave our power. This is my defense of choice um, to tell on myself here. Um, and it is a place where we move away from other people. We're, we disconnect, we run away, we hide. Um, we believe that we don't matter. Um, we, need to, we need to recharge away from other people. Um, 
And it's really scary for, for in this survival pattern to be close to people. Um, the second survival pattern is moving away or moving towards others, moving towards others. And this is a really common uh, intimacy pattern, survival pattern in therapists, healers, coaches, where we, we give, but we give in order to receive like, you know, oftentimes it's like, I think it's an example that I gave yesterday where we, you know, we learn in our early life, right? Maybe with a parent, we have to parent our parent. Um, we have to take emotional care of a parent. And then we learn, we have this perfect job to do that in, right? We have a perfect job as a therapist or as a healer to take care of other people. And this is how we get fed, right? But then when somebody is not happy with us, we're like, oh no, right? We're really scared of like losing clients or we start to transgress some of our own boundaries in order to get clients or keep clients. We need to be liked, right? So this is how this stuff comes across. Um, and I'll speak more a little bit to that as we move forward. So the other one is pulling in and down. And this is called the enduring pattern, right? This is part of us, part of our pattern. And I just wanna say like everybody has all of the patterns to different degrees. And this is not a, a way of shaming. This is just about awareness. Um, this pulling in and down is like, this is like we limit our capacity for joy. Maybe we had to be really obedient children. Maybe we grew up with a parent who was really dominating and we couldn't say no. So we had to people please and say yes all the time and really compact our really big exuberant energy. We had to compact it to the place where we like, we hold it and we bear down on it, right? It is really a holding down, a constriction. And then the fourth energy pattern is pulling up and out. This is also one of mine, which is which you see a lot in, in people who have power over, where we like we move up and we move out, right? We we control other people. We like, okay, what are you doing? No, 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 this needs to be managed this way. No, we're gonna do it my way, right? That kind of thing. We take control as a way of feeling safe or we're constricted. And this is, this is like the constriction part is like so common in white American culture. This is about constricting emotions. This is about limiting our range of emotion, our expression. So, and we like in this constriction, we don't allow ourselves to um, trust our bodies and what our bodies are telling us. Instead, we lead with our head. Yes, these do correlate with, with the prana values. Yes, there's so much, you know, all these disciplines, all these embodiment um, disciplines, they're connected to one another. So I'm just gonna look at the questions here. Yes, staying in integrity. Yes, thank you. Staying in integrity with your heart, right? In the, the last pattern I spoke about, the constriction pattern, we are like in our heads and we try to like figure things out with our heads. And so we need to drop into our hearts and like lead with our hearts and lead with our pussies, with our passion, because this is where the truth is. And we think the truth is in here, but our truth is connected to that nervous system place. And we, we don't have, um, yeah, it's, we're not going to get it from here. So because I love to work with healers and leaders, many of which identify as empaths, these are my people of choice. Um, I'm most familiar with the pattern of moving towards others. And I'll give that example more deeply now, right? Filling our needs by helping others, giving out, giving out. And at the same time that we're giving out, right? We feel good giving. Ooh, we get all of the, all of the good girl awards by giving. 
But then we're simultaneously not receiving support from others. We're depleting ourselves because our capacity to receive is limited. So this not only is about support, but it's also about, it affects our relationship with money, like our own abundance, because we are depleting ourselves. So we're constantly operating from a place of depletion. We're drained, we collapse after giving so much, right? We might be like, dun, 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 ugh, and we collapse. And that recreates a really similar role and maybe even the same role that we had as children where we had to give from places we didn't have or we didn't get to feel our own needs because the need of our parent or our caregiver or even a sibling was had a had a like a larger priority and sometimes we give to the point where we feel resentful like i'm giving so much like why don't people see how much i'm giving like i want to be recognized for what I'm giving. So we are in that pattern, we're disconnected from the reality that we can fill our own needs. And this is what I teach people is how to fill your own needs. And it's not to say that we're, um, you know, we're an island and we just need to fill our own needs and do it by ourselves and like sort of like pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We're really recognizing the power that you do have and that when you ask for help, you are in a sense meeting your own needs, right? You are recognizing your own needs and, and you're asking for support. You're saying, can I get support from you so that I can fill myself up, right? So that is a way that we can consciously have our power. And so I just want to just briefly describe how these are formed, right? How this, how this happens. When we're, when we're children, like our egos are not developed. Our nervous systems are in the process of developing. We don't have a, a capacity to really understand our environments. We are egocentric beings as, you know, like rightfully so. And, um, and so we experience overwhelm. Like when somebody's angry at us, or when somebody shames us, we experience it as overwhelming, we go, <gasps> right? And there's a need for us to make ourselves feel safe in that process of overwhelm, right? And so we use a strategy. We're like, okay, well, I won't bring that, right? Like when I was little, I was very dramatic. I'm, and this is why I'm dramatic now. I'm very dramatic. I'm very show and very expressive. And that wasn't appreciated all the time. I was like a loud mouth. I was like, oh, this is wrong. I don't like this. Da, 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 da. And that wasn't welcome. I was to be seen and not heard. And so I, and I shut down my voice. Right? I was like, okay, that's not, I won't get love if I keep doing this, right? So I'm going to shut it down. And okay, when I'm quiet, I'm liked more. It's actually nicer for me. So I'm going to keep doing that. That works for me, right? If the strategy is successful, we repeat the strategy, but then we, we constrict our throats. We shut down part of our energy and the strategy becomes a habit and the habit forms a pattern and the muscles in our bodies, the energy forms around these patterns, right? So the patterns don't describe who we are, but obscure who we are. And the healing process unveils a broader, deeper concept of who you are and opens up your capacity for intimacy and connection. And pleasure, as we were talking about yesterday, opens you up to be able to do that, to receive, to be received, to be seen, to be loved, to express yourself fully. That is pleasure. So I'm going to look at the questions here. Okay. Yes, I'm trembling because I'm cold. <laughs> I'm trembling because I'm in a cold room. So yes, ugh, I'm uncomfortable in my body right now. But um, and I'm holding space for that too. I'm holding space for myself to be uncomfortable. So all right. And so actually experiencing our wholeness is our greatest pleasure right? And to be, to express ourselves fully. 
Um, and when we get hurt, when we're stuck in patterns, we're often focused on what we fear and on what feels bad. And pleasure connects us, well, what feels good? What is working? Like, let's move towards that. And it's not like we leave the stuff that feels bad behind, but we like, we bring it with us in a different way. And the whole therapy system is so focused on deficiency, a diagnosis, scarcity. We talk about problems all the time. And pleasure brings your attention to what feels good and to what is generative. And I, and I think especially for, for black and brown women, we may need to focus on what is generative because I see so many women of color talking about how exhausted they feel because like it is super difficult to do the work of conscious co-creation or like being a healer and a leader in in spaces where we have to like where we have to like do more show up bigger um we have to like really express ourselves in a deeper way and we have to like protect our peace in other words um i think we get just more shit or we have to like really dig deeper um, to show up. I, I keep saying show up, but it's like, yes, like when you, um, when you present yourself to be real with what is happening. Um, and so this generative approach is helps rewire the brain and calms your nervous system to make it, to make you feel more relaxed and receptive. And pleasure is returning to that state of wholeness and fullness of expression. And I like to say fierce expression because that makes me feel excited. So we work generally, generatively, generatively instead of reactively. So, so pleasure can take on many forms. And I like lazy forms of pleasure because I'm sort of like, <sighs> I like to just do this. I'm a simple person. I like to do simple things. So it can be like, as you're doing healing work, it can be like setting a scene, lighting a candle, um, maybe getting under a cozy blanket or looking at something beautiful or creating a beautiful space around you. It can be self-touch practices. Like I'm touching my thighs right now. It's kind of getting myself a little bit warm. It can be connecting to your senses, right? Like looking at a beautiful painting or looking out of the window and just taking that into your body and filling yourself up that way. And pleasure can be getting in alignment with your desires. Like, mm, who would I most love to work with? Or what would feel right to me, right? Because sometimes we say yes to things because we feel like we have to say yes, but like, what if I just said yes to the things that I wanted to say yes to? How delicious would that be? And pleasure means following your intuition. What's, what feels right? Like something about this doesn't quite feel aligned, right? What, how do I, like what's the next step for me? And you can do that following spirit, following guidance, following that, that divine power within yourself. And all of this supports your nervous system and creates safety, you know, when exploring parts of you that need to be met with compassion, with self-acceptance and with presence. And that presence, you know, basically what we're talking about here is self-acceptance and self-love. And that presence is that really deep, pure love that already exists inside of you right? It's integration. And when we create that safety within ourselves, that's how we then show up in the world in our relationships. <sighs> so that's the end of my TED talk today. But I wanted to see what your questions are. Hi, Julia motherfucking Wells. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, yeah, so yeah, ask any questions that you want. I'll give you a couple minutes to ask questions in the chat. And I'm just going to rub my hands together, which is one of my, my practices for calming my nervous system. <sighs> and just like, just bringing my hands over my arms. 
curious about how to begin to find pleasure even slightly when one feels so disconnected to the self. Mm, okay. Yes, and we grew up, you know, um, believing that pleasure is a sin. That's right. But we're redefining pleasure, right? The process is about redefining pleasure and not from an intellectual place, but from an embodied place, really changing the story in our bodies. And beginning to find pleasure can be like, especially when you've grown, when you've had religious conditioning is about like just looking around. Maybe it is taking in a beautiful painting. And when I say taking it in, it's not just appreciating it, like just from the, from your eyes out, but it's like, really allowing it to affect you to come into your body and to feel it, right? To feel it in your system, to have it nourish your cells. Looking at a sunset, right? Just taking in through the eyes, taking in nourishment through the eyes. And right? it can be as simple as that. And letting that land in your body and allowing it, as you breathe, allowing it to circulate in your system, in your body. That can, that's for me, the simplest form of pleasure. It can be like this cup of tea. It can be this cup of tea that I'm giving to myself in this moment. I'm filling myself up with this cup of tea. I am giving to myself. It can be an exercise that you do like a, you know, a yoga practice. It can be singing, like whatever your talents are. It can just start with what you know. So I have a question here. Finding pleasure. Mm, finding pleasure in, in your venture, in your podcast. Yeah. Yeah, wanting it to be perfect and wanting to control it. Yeah. And I, and I like, I am so, I'm so all about control. I love control too. <laughs> and so I want to, I want to be in relationship with my controller, right? You want to, this is, this is relational work. I want to be in relationship to my controller. I want to be really aware of what does the controller want? Mm, I want to get up in there and I want to have everybody do and say the things that I want them to do and say, right? I want it to be perfect, right? And so can you breathe into that space? Can you give that part of you some time to express themselves? And can you figure out, like, can you feel into the deeper need of the controller? Can you feel the deeper need? of that part of you, right? How is it connected to safety? Yeah, so those are the questions you wanna be asking yourself. Whenever you, that part pops up, you wanna just be asking yourself, what is the deeper need here? What is it that you want from this, right? Really from a place of need, and it's like meeting yourself in a really tender, compassionate way. Right, because we often like when we find, when those places in us pop up, it's like, oh, why am I being so controlling? We just kind of double down on that harshness. But if we can ask, what is it that you need right now? What is it that you need? Okay, I can feel your need. Oh, you want to feel safe, or you want to be loved? You want to be loved for the work that you do? Well, that makes sense. That's okay. Right? You want to be seen. Of course, of course you want to be seen, right? So it's a way of, right? Yes, I use a lot of humor in my work. Thank you, Melody. I use a lot of humor in my work because sometimes we take ourselves so seriously. So what if we poke a little bit of fun into this and we deflate that, that really threatening, scary place? That's why I like to play. And part of my sexuality is my playfulness. Right? When I wasn't connected to my sexuality, I was like a very serious psychologist. Right? <laughs> and I, you know, I did a fine job. I served the people that I served, but I wasn't having fun. And so now I have fun doing what I do and I fucking love it. 
And I want you to have fun too. And I don't want you to take yourself so seriously. And healing can be an amazing, beautiful, opening, pleasurable journey. It doesn't need to be like, like what I like to say, the hunger games of emotional growth, right? Your emotional sovereignty can come by way of playfulness and pleasure. <sighs> Thank you all for being here. I love you so, so, so much. It's so, I like I... When I, um, when I was creating this training, I was like, I wanna do it by Zoom because I wanna see faces and I love seeing your beautiful faces here. I love you so much, mm, bellas. And I will see you tomorrow for day three where we'll talk about um, recognizing and decolonizing internalized systems of oppression. Mm -hmm. One of my favorites, all right. <laughs> All right. Yummy. Yummy. Bye. <laughs>